Only You by Cassie Alexander Narrated by Bunny Warren I woke from the kind of dreams my mother warned me about as the ship we were on lurched hard, paused for a moment, and then lurched again. Matror? I asked, sitting up, wiping a hand across my eyes. Why are we jumping? My elderly guardian woke much more slowly. She'd been my second mother since I was a child. I don't know, princess. I'll go find out, she said, rocking up out of her bed, closer to the door. It opened for her just as the ship made another disconcerting shudder, making her cling to the doorframe before she could right her older bones. I got out of bed myself, much more slowly, and put my slippers on. The ship we were on, the Jofan, had had engine trouble three days ago, and at first I was worried that it was some action against me. I had recently survived an assassination attack, likely plotted by one of my many, many siblings. But the captain's concern for his ship seemed genuine when Maitre and I were forced to dine with him each night, and my father had sent me a confirmed message, I had decrypted it with the palace key, saying a rescue ship was coming. But for some reason right now, the Jofan was trying to jump so hard it made the entire ship quake. Another attempt on my life? No. Because to jump when you were unable to guarantee safe completion was to risk death. And as far as I knew, no one on the Jofan was willing to die to kill me. So we were under attack. Or we were about to be. The whole ship shuddered again, and I clung to the end of my bed frame. What fate was so dire it was worth risking a hundred lives for, five different times, to escape? I got to the door myself before the entire ship shook as something crashed into it, and I knew the answer even before Matrar came racing back, clinging to a wall as the ship began to tilt precariously. Skarsarek, she shouted. Princess, get to the pods! I turned to race down the hall as the floor slid sideways, running as fast as I could, my red hair streaking behind me. I made it to the first pod bay and held the door open, waiting for Matra to catch up as the lights went out, panic quickly closing my throat. I'd never seen a live Skarsarak in person before, just in the pictures and videos my father's men sent out after conquering nests of them, showing how he was protecting our society. Skarsarak were shiny and black, multi-legged, and above all else, dangerous. Capricious, violent, and cruel. Capable of wiping entire ships full of people, even entire planets, off the map. Which was why my father had almost killed them to a man. Or a bug, if that's what they were. Matur! I called into the darkness, my body blocking the door from closing. The only illumination was from the red escape pod lights behind me. Matur, where are you? Then I saw her, a ghost of a figure, stumbling down the hall. I'd only barely kept my own footing as the ship rocked. She must have injured herself. And I would have run to her, only I knew if I did, the door might lock behind me. And who knew what kind of panic sequence our captain had set us on. Or if the Skarsarak were in charge of our electronics already. Matur, hurry, I begged her waving her forward with my hands, holding the door open with my hips. Hurry! She kept walking toward me in a jerking fashion, and I lost a crucial second to escape as a thing out of my nightmares resolved. Matro was dead, but a Skarsarak was holding her body in front of himself with his assorted claspers, dancing her like a puppet, his own flat back shell hiding in the darkness behind her. Matro! I said, sobbing in horror, then dove back into the bay, but it was too late. The Skarsarek cast her corpse aside and threw his arm in to block the door. I scrambled, running for the nearest pod, ready to hurdle myself inside it, sure the Skarsarek was close behind. But the pod's door slammed shut, and it gassed itself out into the darkness of space, empty. I whirled and saw he hadn't followed me. He'd gone to the controls instead, and was operating them with several of his minor appendages. I frantically looked around. The rest of the pods were gone, and now I was trapped in here, with him. He waited for me to realize at first, standing still, pulling all of his claspers back against his chest, where their black outer claws folded up, looking like ribs against his chest, leaving him with just arms and legs that also ended in claws. 
And when the horror set in, when I put my hands to my face ready to scream, he laughed. At least, that's what I thought it was. His head was covered in the same black shell as the rest of him, articulated at joints for his fanged lower jaw, which I knew could stretch wide enough to bite a man's whole head off, or a much smaller girl's. His laughter sounded like rocks clattering and hisses combined. He leapt over the pod's console to land beside me easily, the claws on his feet clattering against the metal floor, his long tail waving behind him. And as to what was going to happen now, I had heard so many frightening stories. His tone changed from rocks to just the hissing, and as he tilted his head, I knew he was inspecting me with his array of eyes. There were six of them across his forehead, almost at the top, in a line, holding the only color on his body, gold pupils that told you where his attention were focusing. And right now, all of them were on me. Don't, I told him, backing up against the empty pod door. One of my hands scrambled for the controls, hoping to find the right combination of buttons to press to space us both before I could come to harm. Don't you dare, I said as he came even closer. He clicked at me, mocking me, I feared, taking hold of me with the claws at the end of his arms where hands should be. They pinned me to the wall and lifted me up to where I couldn't hit any buttons anymore. Then I watched in horror as the claspers on his chest opened up, set after set of them, unlacing from his body to reach for me, each of them on their own articulated arms, their tips alternating between claws for cruelty and brushes to keep a carapace clean. At least that's what they told us at school when we dissected one. And now, they clawed at the front of my nightdress, tearing into the fabric, pulling it open, exposing me, as the organ I feared emerged from beneath them a long, bulbous, black lacquered knob, the width of my wrist at its smallest parts, the thicker parts quite a bit more. It looked as hard as the rest of his shell and was already shining with his lubrication fluid, glowing red by the emergency lights. Thick, 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 he continued, pressing his body closer to mine, and now I could smell him, sharp and bitter, like the scent of fresh sap. No, I panted thrashing, trying to get away from him, ineffectually shoving at his chest, clawing at his eyes. You can't. But he could, and he was going to, which meant I only had a second to decide. Only you, I told him as he finished stepping up, running the hard, slickened length he wanted to put in me between my thighs. Only you, do you understand? Only you. I said as the head of him found my softest part and began pushing itself inside. Only you, only you, only you, I repeated like a prayer and whimpered as he parted me. Thick, 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 he said back, and I had no idea what that was or what it meant. All I could do was throw myself on his mercy, not even knowing if he had any. I grabbed hold of his most prominent fangs, not to pry them apart or push him away, just to be sure that I had his attention. And I got it, the gold glints in his array of all black eyes focusing on me instantly. Only you, I told him with a shake as he took his first thrust. I whined in anger, disgust, and fear. Do you hear me? I asked, shaking him again. I knew some Skarsarak understood our tongue, if only to attack our ships better. Only you! I shouted at him. His eyes watched me coolly, and the sound of the thick thick thicks he was making sped up. And then the doors to the bay opened up behind him. Other Skarsaraks fell to the ground and raced in, running up to us at once on all fours before standing again. The two nearest released their claspers at once, extending their organs out towards me, and I knew they might not even wait their turn. I'd heard stories of women and men dying, pulled apart, with holes cut into them, so multiple scars racks could satisfy themselves at once. So I stopped resisting and threw myself into the many, many arms of the one that held me, cowering against his hard chest, his rod spearing me between my thighs. Only you, I whispered to him as I felt his claspers wrap around me, keeping me suspended. One of the others said something harsh, as all their language was to me, and the one who held me snarled something back at them. Please, I wished with my eyes squeezed tight. I heard them talk more, yell, 
and then the one I was clinging to said something that sounded final. I was so scared I couldn't breathe, and then he began to walk. Scar's racks clattered alongside of us, down the hall. I saw one race past on the wall when I dared to peek, its long, stinger-tipped black tail fluttering behind it. As for the rest of the ship and her crew, it was carnage. I squeaked without meaning to and went back to closing my eyes again. I didn't need to see to smell the death or to hear the satisfied, chittering sounds the scars racks made to one another, pleased with themselves and their hunts. What was to become of me? The one that carried me still had himself jabbed deep inside, and I couldn't entirely say I was happy to be alive, considering all the things that might befall me. Every scars rack we passed seemed to need to greet the one that held me, though, and he made their sharp sounds back, until we were in another wing of living quarters, where the crew stayed and a mechanical door opened up. His claspers held me tighter, and I dared to glance around. We were in the captain's quarters. I recognized the man's belongings. Matra and I had had to dine with him every night, as he tried, through me, to curry my father's favor, although it became clear as our trip continued that he was also an old man with hope, because I was a lesser princess. Due to my station, I had been forced to be polite, but I had been pleased that Maitre had always dined with us for the sake of my propriety. The cabin was empty, at least. He'd gone down with his ship, rather than be caught by surprise like we had. The claspers lifted me off of the Scarzerac's organ, and I gasped as they threw me aside, shrieking for a moment in panic before I landed on the captain's bed. Everything was colored by dim emergency lighting, which made the alien's shell shine a dull orange gold and I could see the many scars and dents he had upon it as I backed up, curling my legs into a ball, hiding myself against the captain's pillows. Thuk, 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 he said, as his claspers moved to clean the part of himself he just had in me, with his brush feet, in what seemed like disgust. I had the dark stain of his lubrication between my thighs, and he carried the mark of my virgin blood on his organ. If you didn't want to get covered in my fluids, you shouldn't have hurt me, I said, throwing an arm out at him. He leaned forward and made an ominous rattling sound. Then the ship shook again. I fell back as he turned and left, his stinger-tipped tail whisking behind him before the door closed. Time passed, and I had no idea how much of it. I could have crawled out to the captain's living room, and I should have tried to escape, only I was too traumatized. I couldn't even bring myself to go into the bathroom and clean myself up. I felt like moving, like interacting with the rest of the world in any single way would have been to commit to this being my new reality. Admitting defeat. Acknowledging that I was here. Whereas if I stayed still and quiet and kept closing my eyes, I could pretend that all of this was just a dream. That any minute now I'd wake up and Metro would be alive and the Jofan would be okay and that we would dock and I would fly off of the ship and into my father's arms momentarily. Then the Scarzerac came back. This time he was wearing something, a strange shell on top of his other shell. I didn't understand. I could just see that it was mottled and unevenly covered as he took it off, setting it down with what seemed like reverent care. And then he turned toward me. I started panting my terror overriding every lick of common sense as he stalked up and leaned over, extending his jaws fully out before clicking his lower fangs together. I shrieked and protected myself with both my hands. My name is Droma, I called out. Please don't hurt me. His fangs clicked again, once, twice, as I slowly lowered my hands. At some point in time, the ship's lights had turned back on, which let me see him fully. His shell was covered in deep gashes, and there was a strange stamped divot on each of his shoulders. Please don't hurt me more, I mean, I said, correcting myself, tears gathering at the corners of my eyes. I dared to look at his alien face again, not even knowing what it was I wanted there, when the Scarzerac didn't have compassion. He clicked his lower fangs again, hissed, and then mounted the bed, crawling toward me, his claspers unfurling. He grabbed hold of my ankles and pulled my legs out wide. No, 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 I pleaded with him as he lowered himself above me, and his brushes began to rub against my thighs, flaking away bits of stuck-on blood and dried lubricant. Don't, 
I protested. Then I realized he wasn't threatening me. Yet. Just cleaning me. As he made disgusted little hisses. He clattered at me, almost in disappointment. It's still your fault, I told him, a hand across my mouth. This. All of this. Now that I felt sure he didn't understand me, there wasn't any harm in talking, I supposed. How dare you touch me? Not only am I a citizen of the 40th Loyal Empire, I am royalty. I am Daroma, the High King's 23rd daughter, from his third favorite consort, and, as I am in his favor, the 12th in line to the throne. The brushing feet of his claspers were rubbing hard, trying to get the stains off my skin, when the real stains from today were already imprinted on my soul. How dare you touch me, Skarzarek, I said, putting a hand on his shoulder and shoving. The alien was built like stone and didn't move, just kept watching me with the golden flecks in his eyes, looking from my eyes to my mouth again and again as I spoke to him. How dare you touch me, I repeated as one of his brushing feet rose up. It ran straight against my seam all of the little tendril-like fur feathers on it, rubbing right against me, and I gasped. The scars rack chittered back. Thick, 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 he said, like the beating of a heart, and touched me there again. No, don't, I complained, reaching down to protect myself, but his strong arm caught me and pinned it back as his brushes kept on rubbing. I tried to pull my thighs closed, but I couldn't. His knees were in between them. If I squeezed him any harder, I'd just get bruised. He hissed over me, moving himself so that more of his brushing feet could touch me, his three lowest sets of claspers now rocking between my legs in synchrony, not even going inside me, just petting my soft skin with his soft fur, over and over again, rubbing the part of me that I knew I could touch in pleasure back and forth. As an heir to the throne, I had never been with a partner, and I could count the times I'd slept alone at night without a guard or matriarch on just one hand. But I knew what was building in me now. As a consort, my mother had been sure to train me up in her power, and this looming, brutal Skarsrak was going to be the first stranger to give it to me. Stop, I said, writhing, just trying to take my body back from him. It was unfair. I didn't want to feel like this, especially not below him but his touches were relentless, and I knew soon I'd have no choice. He said, speeding up, as if urging me on, and then he croaked a word. Only. My hands wound in the sheets at my side. I wasn't sure if I'd heard it at first. It could have been chance, some random combination of sounds. Then he said it again, this time with a hissing growl. Only, he said repeating my first word to him back to me, his tone becoming clearer. My heart caught in my throat as his brushes kept going on, patting me, rubbing me, stroking me, repeatedly, faster than my fingers ever would have managed. Only, he crooned. Oh, I gasped, feeling on the verge of giving in. Oh, no, then I took a deep inhale as his lower fangs gnashed, and I cried out, thrashing as much as he allowed me, my orgasm pouring through me, everything in me tensing up and then releasing in strong waves, taking me for just one moment to somewhere peaceful, even as they felt wrong, until I was finished, and in my own body again, whimpering on a dead man's bed. The Skarsrak made a deep chuffing noise, then lifted up, using his brushing feet on one another to clean himself off, before picking me up with his arms and taking me into the captain's bathroom. He walked into the captain's cleaner with me, triggering it, and sound waves beat against the both of us, my skin and his shell, vibrating us clean, which meant he knew that it was here and what it was for, which meant that when he'd been over me, cleaning me, touching me, he'd absolutely been doing it with purpose. He left me again after that, and this time I climbed out of bed, still wearing the shreds of my nightdress and one slipper, to inspect the strange, hard, shelled thing he'd left behind, crawling on the floor with it to be on its level. 
It was indeed a shell, but things were mounted on it. Fragments of bone, human teeth, alien claws I didn't recognize. I'd never heard of Skarsrak wearing clothing, but I knew that's what this was, and I didn't understand. After that, I stood and went into the captain's closet to get a uniform, cuffing the slacks and belting the vest to fit me. It didn't matter what I wore. There was no way I could blend in with them. But if other humans were alive still, or I could manage to get word to my father, I went up to the door to the hallway, prepared to try to lever it or guess the captain's code when it slid open. The scars rack hadn't even been worried I'd escape him. I wound my hair into a bun and crept along one wall. I'd toured the entire ship repeatedly, so I ought to know where I was going. But the light was poor, and the ship was trashed. We were probably being hauled by the Skarsrak's own ship, back to who knew where. But there were emergency beacons for times just like this. Had the captain gotten to release them before he was murdered? Or had he been too busy trying to make the engines jump to safety? How many Skarsrak were on the Jofan? While the crew could have been subdued by just a handful, if there weren't that many, then it meant that everything might not be surveilled at once. I slunk down to where my hall joined another, and then chose to go right. The aliens probably had people at the control center. But if I could get down into engineering, maybe I could do something manually. I made it down three more hallways, until I spotted one. I already knew it wasn't the one who'd taken me. The shells of his shoulders were almost pristine. I crouched down quietly, peeking around the corner, waiting for him to go. If he wasn't coming my direction, then he was just on patrol, or wandering around looking for salvage. He would leave, and then I would make another left, and then a short, sharp right, and be in. I heard a hissing sound from behind me, and slowly turned. Another Skarsrak had snuck up on me. And whatever passing familiarity I now had with one, this one did not share. He made a series of chittering sounds as his claspers let down, the claws at their ends eagerly clacking against one another, and there was no feeling of sexual threat from him. He was all threat, completely. I bolted into the next hallway, hoping I could somehow dodge the other alien as this new one bounded after me. One of them complained to the other, and then they were both giving chase. I twisted and raced, knowing that there was no way I could escape them, until I reached engineering's closed door. It was locked. I pounded an impotent fist on it and spun. The two scars wreck that had followed me were equidistant now, spread out so that I had nowhere to run, and both of them unhinged their jaws, showing me the inner workings of their mouths. And then he was there. He raced up behind them and bounded over them to land between them and me, saying harsh words to them in their tongue. One of them fell back, briefly kneeling, saying, Shh, the duck. The other, though, lunged. And faster than I could almost see, my alien whipped his tail around, exposing his bladed stinger, and lashed this one beneath his jaw, severing his head in the process. It thumped down, jaw flapping uselessly, as dark ichor pumped out of his neck's hole. I screamed, and the doors to engineering opened behind me. The three Skarsrak there took one look at what had happened and fell to kneeling as well. Shh, the duck, they intoned, agreeing with the first one. Shh, the talk, I tried with my exposed throat and soft tongue. The Skarsrak I knew walked up to me, folded a claw into my hair, and clipped a strand, tugging it free. Then he went back to the freshly severed head and shoved it into the man's open maw, before looking around expectantly. The other aliens made no move at this but I knew the gesture had been seen. Shh, the talk, I tried again. Better. Thuck, thuck, my alien said to me dismissively, leaning over to snap off one of the downed Skarsrak's fangs. Then he took a lunging step at me and roared. I felt I was safe, but I thought I also knew what he wanted, so I ran back down the corridor as I'd just come through, all the way back to my new home. He didn't return for hours. But when he did, it was with food for me. I knew because he brought it to me, shoving the plate in my direction. He hadn't brought utensils. He probably didn't use them. You didn't need to when each of your hands was tipped with a rudimentary fork and a knife. 
I took the plate from him, but then set it down on the bed where I'd been waiting. I wasn't hungry. Shthtuck, I said hopefully, pointing to him. And then, Droma, I said, pointing to myself. Droma, I repeated, tapping myself on the chest. I knew the Skarsarak tongue was still a mystery to us, but I also knew what I'd heard them calling him, and that he'd managed to say only. Shthtuck, I said, then Droma, pointing at the two of us. He ignored me utterly and clipped off a piece of the food he'd brought, some kind of meat cube, like the cooks had doctored up into appetizing food to serve later. He speared a bit of it on his claw tip and brought it to my lips, trying to put it in my mouth, same as he'd put my hair into his dead companions earlier in the day. I took it and then spit it back out on the plate. He hissed at me, fangs clashing. What a disappointment I must be to you, Shthok, I told him. He tilted his head, and the golden flecks in his eyes all focused on me. But you killed your own man for me, I said. No, not for me, but because of me. Because he was not deferent to you regarding me. I knew all about how courts worked. I had swum in their dangerous waters my whole life. Droma, I said, pointing to myself yet again. I set the entire plate aside, exaggeratedly shaking my head. Droma is not hungry, I said, and I wasn't. But power was currency. And as much as I wanted to hate him and the rest of his kind, Shthok had it. I steeled myself. If I survived this until my father rescued me, no one need ever know how I had managed it. It could just be a secret that I kept and that Shthok took to his grave. I briefly rose up onto my knees, then folded my feet behind me and sat back on them, putting my hands between my knees and looking at my lap, the traditional pose of supplication, the one all of us children took when our father walked amongst our ranks. And then I looked up at Shthok with weary eyes beneath my tawny lashes. Show me yourself again, Shthok, and I will delight you. The Skarsrak's entire bearing changed, likely because he was unused to this version of me. He reached for the plate of food again, and I shoved it further out of the way, before he could touch it, then regained my poise. He made a <laughs> sound of warning as I put a hand out, but didn't take it, or otherwise swat it away. No, he stayed still as I crawled forward, resting my palm against his chest. Did Skarsrax have one heart or three? I couldn't remember from biology. I tapped a careful finger on his chest and traced an undulating line down the back of his claspers, feeling them rattle beneath me as they reacted to my presence. I wanted what was hidden beneath them, and I was worried for a moment he might deny me. But then they unfurled in my wake in a rolling wave until I could see the part of him I was looking for, tucked in tightly below. His sex organ was like a long and dark sword, bulbous and rippling, and now that I could safely see it, I realized it was as articulated as the rest of him. Thuck, 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 he continued, but he didn't stop me. Droma, I said, placing my other hand on my chest, my balance precarious. Shthok, I said, finally touching its tip myself. It thrust forward eagerly into my hand, and the same dark fluid that had stained me earlier began oozing from its tip. It was horrifying. He was horrifying. And yet, I swept a brave finger through the fluid and brought it to my tongue. It was bitter, but not badly so. And most importantly, I didn't think that it was poisonous. Or earlier, with it in me, I surely would have died. He pissed into his appendage at me, as the rest of him stayed still. Droma, I said again. Shthok likes Droma. Shthok protects Droma. Shthok keeps Droma safe, I said, keeping up a rhythm as I lowered myself in front of him on my elbows, gathering up all of my braveness inside me. I hadn't survived near assassination just to die here ignominiously. My mother had raised me up to take the throne. 
Droma knows what she's doing, I encouraged myself as though my words were hers. And Droma's not scared. Only the strong survive, Stock. And Droma? Droma has been made the strongest. Only, Stock hissed, the one word he'd maybe gotten. Droma only, I agreed, and nodded, tucking the lock of hair he'd cut that fell forward behind my ear. Lubrication fluid poured out of him like his shaft was a dark fountain, and from this close, his sap scent was intense. It reminded me of the woods of my home. Droma, who is going to survive no matter what. Droma, who is going to become empress someday, I said, and lowered my mouth down to take him, fighting not to quake. I had no idea how he had, if he had, any sensation beneath the hard shell of his sheath. But if he did, I licked and sucked, unabashedly covering my face in his dark juices, sputtering when the bitterness took my breath, but only for a moment, before lowering my head back down. Other than the still leaking fluid, though, he made no sign and gave no sound. Was this working? Was it worth it if it was not? Then his bottom set of claspers rotated to bring their brush feet against his shaft, stroking himself beneath me. I balanced on one elbow and tried to do the same with one free hand. He chittered at that, but none of his claspers pushed me away, and his whole hard shaft was slick with his oil now. It was easy enough to rub. So I kept doing what I was doing and hoped, until he pushed me back. Gentler than he had to be, I noticed, as I fell back into a graceful kneel, and watched in a mixture of awe and disgust as a fan of dark, lacy fronds spilled out from his tip, feathering through the air expectantly. Was that it? I looked up at him and saw all of his six eyes were focused on me like laser sights. Then he sent one of his clawed hands up to my face and tapped my chin, prying it open. And once it was, he rattled his claw against my teeth, warning me not to bite him, which I knew if I did would very much be my last action on this plane. I opened my mouth again in obedience, and he let me go, so I could lower myself back down over the writhing tendrils, licking my lips once before I let them in. They crawled into my mouth like they had minds of their own, and rubbed against my cheeks and gums and wrapped my tongue. Everything about the experience was horrible and disconcerting, until Stock began to thrum from somewhere in his chest. His claspers had gone back to stroking himself, and inside my mouth I could feel the tendrils suck and jerk and pulse. I couldn't stroke him anymore. I was afraid of losing my balance if I did, now that he was moving. But I did hum back to him, a noise of encouragement, a higher counterpoint to his own. The whole appendage pistoned, and Stock growled, chittered, his entire hard shaft vibrating. And I was afraid that I would accidentally let go or that he would knock my teeth out. Then there was an explosion of salt and sweet inside my mouth, lines of it, spurting out from wherever the tendrils were. I guarded my throat from swallowing, but waited patiently, holding him in me, until the tendrils relaxed. And I rocked back, sucking myself off of them, to kneel on my bare feet again, his seed drooling from my mouth. Only, he said, rocking back, his tendrils sliding back into his sheath. I let the rest of his ejaculate fall out onto the dead captain's nice vest, and it felt like I could breathe again. Only, I agreed. I slept alone that night, after I went in the cleaner. I had no idea where Stock was. Maybe I wasn't the only survivor. Maybe there were other passengers making deals with him, even now. But I was better for the rest by morning. I nibbled at the plate of food that was still left on my bed, changed clothes, and tried to go outside again. This time, the door was locked. I occupied myself by going through the captain's things and trying to get assorted electronics in his room to respond. Until Stock returned. There was a whiff of the chemicals that were used in the processing chambers about him, where the matter to power jumps was compressed. I recognized it because the captain had once smelled like that too, at dinner. The jump drive's broken beyond repair. Don't you think we tried? He hissed at me, 
and moved to the decorated carapace he'd left behind. He spit on something he held, and then affixed it to the rest of his collection. A fang, like he'd broken off of the Scarzerac's jaw yesterday. And then another, and I didn't know if they were a matched set or if he'd had to commit another murder. Who is that from? If I was right, it was one less Scarzerac for my father to kill. But I couldn't stop myself from asking. And why? The doc didn't answer me. He merely unfastened his claspers and began brushing himself off with them. And when he turned, I saw a dent I was fairly sure I hadn't before, across the tough shell of his back. Did someone attack you? I had no idea how the Skarsrak command chain worked, and Shthdok couldn't tell me. And of course, Shthdok wasn't the only Skarsrak who knew how to open doors. Suddenly being confined to quarters felt a lot less like being kept safe and a lot more like being trapped here. But my mother had told me what every good consort must do if she was to advance in the world. Whatever man you were with, whatever circumstance you were in, it was always your job to bolster him for as long as you needed to. Soft tongues could hide the sharpest knives. I quickly unbunned my long hair, letting it fall loose around my shoulders, and separated another chunk of strands, stretching it to him. The golden flecks inside his eyes danced around strangely, like little flame bugs did on humid nights back home. Go on, I said, reaching for his hand claw, drawing it up. Cut it. Gathering my intent, he did and the loose hair swung down in a loop the color of my own blood. I put one end in my mouth and took the strands between my fingers and braided them, quickly. Only lead daughters were guaranteed servants for such, and Matrior's fingers were too old to help me. If I wanted to be my prettiest and most presentable at all times, it was better to know how to do my own. So soon I had a plate the length of my forearm, made of my own hair, and when I was finished I offered it to him. He took it slowly, extending out his jaw, hissing all the while. I made it. For your uniform, I said, pointing the carabase with trophies out to him. You have conquered me. And if I am with you, you can conquer all others. He made a chittering snicker, followed by another, now familiar, thick, 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 thick. Droma only, I said, pressing the plate closer to him, before taking it back to drape over his decorated carapace's shoulders. For you. He stood at that, pacing closer. Droma only, he repeated. Yes, I said, clapping. Droma only, you and me, I said, pointing. Shthdok tilted his head and made the same gesture with his claw. Me and you, he said, repeating it backwards, but pointing correctly nonetheless, before leaning in to say the word together. I could feel all of the blood in my body sinking like I had landed on a high-grav planet. I hadn't taught him that, which meant, you can understand me. I can understand, Roma, he said, and I feared that he was mocking me as he belabored the words, making them guttural sounds from deep within his throat. How? He pointed to a gouge across his breastplate, and then another, and another. 40th Loyal Empire, 40th Loyal Empire, he repeated with each touch. I remembered the Skarsarak we dissected in biology class. I'd never thought to wonder where it had first come from. Me and you. His tone rose in a question, but his bearing was challenging me. He knew who I was. I told him, and likely that I was lying out of self-protection, because I'd as much as told him that, too. Me and you, he said more strongly, stepping forward, backing me up against the bed. You, he said, picking me up to throw onto the bed again. And me, he said, mounting the bed as well. That means you knew when I was yelling at you to stop, I said, feeling betrayed, and this made Shthdok pause. Told your father to stop before, he said, leaning over me, holding himself up on one arm as all of his claspers unfurled. Soft throat words mean nothing. Soft throat, I repeated, squeezing my eyes shut, preparing for an invasion. 
What an apt name for humans, I thought, trying to send my mind somewhere, anywhere else, as he used his sharpest claspers to cut my clothing off of me entirely. But the next touch I felt on myself was from his brush feet, stroking up and down my body, as he held himself above me. I had just a moment to feel like things might not be the worst, until I felt all of his claspers sink to one side, to flip me over on my stomach, and then I threw my face into my hands and whimpered. All of his claspers wrapped around me as he lay down atop my back, pulling me against him, and he rocked the both of us to our side, all of his many arms holding me against his chest. You and me, Droma, he repeated, the hard shell of his shoulder making an uncomfortable pillow. His claspers held me tight, but his brush feet roamed my body. I had made my bed here, with him, although in the grander sense of things, my father had made it for me. But I still wasn't ready to give up yet. You and me, I agreed in a whisper. Shthtok made a rumbling sound behind me as his brush feet circled both my nipples. In moments, they were both hard and tight, my body betraying me again. Would that it were just my body here and none of the rest of me. Droma, Shthtok crooned as the rest of his brush feet started working in unison, taking strong sweeps down me, and I knew where they were going. More so when he reached down to sling my top leg up over his hips, exposing me. I looked down and saw his organ out, that bitter dark fluid dripping from its tip, the sharp scent of it cutting through the air, and I knew where it was going. I reached back behind myself, my hands flailing against his face, until I caught hold of one of his fangs to hold on to. It didn't stop him from speaking, though. Only, he hissed, and shoved himself in. I cried out, as the place in me only he had known opened up again to take him, his own fluids more than lubricating me enough. Saying he was big seemed an understatement. I felt completely stretched, gasping in his arms, as he started making his thuk -thuk 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 sounds behind me, beginning to easily thrust into me with his organ's articulated bass. I caught one of his claw hands in mine in an instant, and he paused. Slow, I asked him. Slow would make things last longer, which was torturous. But slow was also safe. Slow wasn't torn apart and put on propaganda vids. Please. This he didn't answer. But the brush feet stroking my breasts did go slower, as did the ones palpitating my stomach on their inexorable way between my legs. And inside of me, the bulbous monstrosity slowly pulled out, then slammed its way back in. I cried out again, my head thumping against the shell of his chest behind me. Slow, I demanded. Shthtok did as he was told again, but only halfway, making my soaked channel almost miss him, before plowing back into it, pushing my walls apart. And then his brush feet rocked down to start tickling my clit. A groan ripped from my body at feeling them there. Slow, Shthtok confirmed then rumbled, almost pulling out, and then pistoning into me again. Slow for Droma, he said, taking a long time with the words, even for him, and then hissing what I assumed was laughter. It's not fair, I protested, sending my other hand up, so that now I was holding on to both of his major fangs. His brush feet were industriously rubbing me, my clit, my folds all my taut skin where it was stretched around him, and if I curved forward a bit, I could see where they were below me as well, stroking the length of his exposed shaft too, because I couldn't take all of it in me at once. If I did, I would die. Fair, he repeated, laughing even more. It's just not, I said, trying to thrash, making his claspers hold me tighter. How do you even know to do all this? He made a broad, sound behind me, before answering. Talk later, Droma. Mate first. I whimpered as his rod plowed into me again, and then I gasped as it pulled out of me all the way. But rather than let my swollen slit rest, brush feet tucked inside it, pulling my entrance open, and started stroking at my walls. 
I moaned, surrendering as the sensations overwhelmed me. I was short of breath far beyond how the claspers squeezed me because of panting, and now that his massive cock wasn't in the way, two of the brush feet were assiduously rubbing my clit between them. Then I watched through half-lidded eyes as the dark and grasping tendrils at the end of his tip unfurled. They curled and opened through the air, as if looking for something to hold on to. Oh, I had time to gasp as all of Stock's lowest set of brush feet reached between my legs, tucked inside my entrance, and held me open for them. Oh, 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 I whined as he began to line them up. Stock, don't hurt me, I said, trying to squeeze my thighs. He put out a hand claw to hold my upper knee up and trapped my lower knee with his leg. Droma only, he swore to my safety. At least, that's what I hoped it was, as the tendrils grasped out for me, and one by one, I felt them latch themselves inside. My whole body was clenched in fear as I felt them fight their way into me, slowly squirming deep, the fat head of his shell shaft gushing fluids close behind. I remembered the way they'd sucked onto my cheeks and tongue and gently pulled, and now I could feel them doing that inside me, too as they slowly climbed against my walls, writhing, like they were looking for a path, all the while his brush feet held my entrance wide. It was horrifying, because it was, but also because all of it felt good, and I didn't want it to. I couldn't help it, I was starting to pant. Stimulate you, Stock said with great difficulty. I was stimulated. I couldn't deny it. His fronds were pulling and sucking on me, his shaft was pushing, and his brush feet on my clit and nipples hadn't let up. I was being taken by this horrible scarserac, and I should have been revolted, not impossibly turned on. Stock, I whispered, pulling on his fangs above me with all my might. My body wanted to curve. I was already so close. It's not right. It's not right. I whined, but my body didn't care. Stimulate Droma, he said, and I could hear each syllable of the words vibrating in his throat. Yes, I agreed hoarsely, because I had no choice. Yes, I said, letting go of one of his fangs to crush his brush feet to me so they wouldn't move away. I needed to keep them there. I'm close. Oh no, stuck. Don't. Don't stop, I said. Then it was too late. I was coming, hard, my walls squeezing him, feeling his furls stroke and pull so deep inside me as I did, like they were trying to prolong my orgasm. Stuck crooned behind my back as my body writhed against him, sliding myself up and down his slick shaft, giving howling cries, until I was lost and trembling. Droma, he said slowly with what sounded like appreciation. So stimulated. It's just stimulate, I corrected him in a whisper as I sagged. One of his claspers rotated to brush my cheeks softly. Stimulated droma, he continued. Give me an egg. I blinked as my jaw dropped and a fresh wave of horror set in. The Skarzarak wanted to breed me? I fought against him, harder than I ever had before. No! He yanked me back against his chest, all of his claspers binding me at once. Droma only. Mates, he said, ratcheting them even tighter. Only. And then I realized just how I had doomed myself by the escape pod. The Skarzarak understood enough of my language to know what I was asking for him to be my only. And then I had confirmed as much by bleeding my virgin blood on him, if whomever had taught him the tongue had told him what that was. And then I had come for him. And then I had made him come. And then he was in me now. What else was an alien to think? Mates, I whispered in a drowsy horror as I felt my soul leaving my body behind. Mates, he repeated roughly in my ear, followed by, Stock is not my name, with sudden, brutal clarity, which made me think that all his struggles with my tongue prior had been a lie. 
I wriggled again, and his claspers loosened. I made to look up at him, seeing the fine line where his head joined his body, the only place on his hard throat that wasn't protected, the part he'd cut through when he'd decapitated his friend. What is it? Strugox. What does shtok mean, then? He took my shoulders and pushed me far enough away from him so that I could see the golden dots in each of his six dark eyes. King. My jaw dropped a little. That it was a title explained how the other Skarzarak had used it, why they had been kneeling for him, and why disobedience was not allowed. Then his claspers yanked me back against his chest, and he lowered himself to growl just one word in my ear. Empress. The whole ship, no, the whole galaxy, stopped. He knew exactly what I wanted. And he knew exactly what I'd said. He'd been listening all along. I'd been in training to be Empress my whole life, even though I knew, and my mother knew, and Matror knew, that as only a lesser princess, and the twelfth in favor at that, it would always be out of grasp for me that all I could hope for would be to survive my upbringing in any assassinations and curry favor with whichever one of my siblings took the throne next. I swallowed. Yes, Strugox promised, hissing, taking my hesitance for the agreement that it was. And two of his brush feet started rubbing on my lower belly, right over where my ovaries would be inside. Droma, let down an egg for me, and we will rule. I was panting again, not in panic this time or in lust, but with opportunity. But it seemed best to be honest, though, now, at least where matters of anatomy were concerned. I, I don't know if I have. If not now, soon, Strugox told me. I will stimulate you often, Droma. Brush feet came from my nipples, while the curved back of his claw hand slid up my throat. But what if it doesn't take? I asked him. He hissed before answering. My seed is strong and sticky, he said, and started moving in me again. It all sounded impossible. And yet, the Skarzarak knew my tongue. He definitely knew what he was doing to me. And if somehow I survived, I had a vision of myself, commanding a Skarzarak army, holding a Skarzarak child with a hard shell and blue eyes which I knew should be impossible. And yet, and yet. I reached overhead, letting my fingertips crawl up the hard shell of his face to find his fangs again to hold on. Be careful, I told him, but go deep. Strugox made a satisfied thk, 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 sound. The fronding tendrils at his shaft's tip rolled and sucked. I could feel their searching motions inside my body, like they were looking for more places to own me and then his organs started to piston. When he pulled out, I would feel the tendrils pull, and when he pushed in, I would feel them rough between his shaft and my sides as he stretched me again and again. Let me stimulate you, Droma, he hissed. Make your body give my egg up. I was already sore, and if he weren't still lubricating us, I'd be chafed, but I whispered, I want that. As my jaw dropped, the tips of two little brush feet were dabbing at my clit repeatedly, and I could feel my entire body tensing up against him for a second time. Strugox, I said, trying to say his name. Do it. Make me give an egg to you. He made that thrumming sound behind me, and then the part of him that was in me started to shake like a rattle. I cried out, fighting against his claspers with how tight I was around him, everything in me needing to come. Come, come, I shouted and felt my own fluids rush down, squirting over his as his organ throbbed against my thick, swollen walls, and I knew from his thrumming that he was losing himself inside me. Droma only, he growled, shoving himself deep, his tendrils fighting against my walls as he pumped me with his release. Droma, he said in time with his thrusts, only. I sagged against him as he withdrew himself from me, and I felt a gush between my legs. His claspers released me carefully as he pulled away, gently leaving me on my side. Sleep, Droma, 
he told me. Rest. I lay there in the vast wet spot we'd created on the mattress, breathing, one hand wrapped around my belly where his brush feet had just been, wrung out for the second time. I could hardly do anything else. My mother claimed to be a dream seer. It was how she came into the emperor's favor. She always knew just what to tell him in the morning. It was how she'd gained her way up from the planet that had been her home, when he had seen her and demanded her, and when he could have thrown her away or had her killed, until she'd stood third on his right side. But she'd told me the true truth when I was old enough to hear it, that she didn't have any powers, nor would I. Our home world was a ferocious place, with tornadoes that streaked the land thousands of feet high, and all we'd gained from it was merely a preternatural ability to sense a change in weather. And so when I dreamt all night of storms, I was not surprised when I woke up to find the Scarsrex's face between my thighs. What are you doing? I demanded of him. Cleaning you, he said. He managed the sounds with his jaws spread out, fangs indenting my delicate skin as he held me open for him. I watched as a wide, flat proboscis emerged from the depths of his gullet, and from it, a fleshy tongue. He pushed it into me, and brought a whole mouthful of his own spunk back out to swallow it down. I pushed myself up on my elbows, concerned. I thought I needed your seed in me. He made a chittering noise. Laughter? This is old seed, Droma, he said. The next time he could, in between bites and it is time to give you more. Oh, I told him. I guessed that made sense. And I wasn't in a position to question him besides. So I watched and felt it as he lapped himself deeper, pulling tonguefuls of his own soot-colored semen out of me, until the fluids on his tongue were just mine, clear and stretchy. Strugox made a hissing sound at that and pulled his tongue inside, but left his proboscis out. He rolled it rudely from side to side, and then latched it onto me around my clit. Scarzarak, I shouted like it was a curse, but his jaw still held me open, and the golden dots of his pupils roamed up and down my body as he started sucking onto me. That's what we were here for, what I was here for. I closed my eyes and threw myself back onto the bed, remembering when he'd called me Empress. Inside his proboscis, his tongue's tip probed me as he sucked. You, I panted, feeling waves of sensation pour through me. You, you, just... He started thrumming of his own accord, his proboscis channeling his vibrations through to me as the tip of his tongue softly licked inside. You, I complained. You! He finally released me. Strugox, he named himself. I gasped down the length of my body at him, my clit red and sensitive and tender. He who claims you. And then he clambered over me, his claspers moving as one to pull me up, and almost in the same motion sliding his well-oiled self inside. I gasped again, still sore from the last time, as I wrapped my legs around his hips on instinct. You want to give me an egg, Droma? I can tell. You are ready. It is time. I'd seen what he'd last lapped out of me. I was nervous he was right. I looked up his chest's shell at him, my head hanging as I was suspended against him by his claspers, my hair trailing behind me on the bed. Will carrying your child hurt me? No, he answered, sounding sure. How do you know? He bowed his head to see me. Because, Droma, he said, you are my only... I swallowed, stealing myself, feeling his lubrication fill me up and then leak down, dripping on the bed. And then I reached for one of his fangs to make him look at me again. Do you promise? No one at the emperor's court would traffic in something as prosaic as promises. But here, they were all I had. Strugox chittered. Definitely laughter. Female, no one else could touch my fangs and live. I nodded then. Only... Only Strugox. And his whole body rattled at that, each of his shells clattering where they touched. Only Strugox, he agreed. His claspers started rocking my body then, using me to satisfy his sheath. I will release in you, my Droma. 
My, and here he chittered a word I didn't know, will wind you tight. Yes, I breathed, clutching him with my knees and wriggling beneath him. He made other strange sounds at that and thucked me. Does that feel good? Yes, he grunted. But not as good as. His words drifted to chitters. I felt his tendrils extend inside me again, and I clawed my fingernails against the shell of his back. I was swinging in his claspers now, between my own rocking, and the jerks of his organ as it kept thrusting. And then one of his claw hands came for me, winding carefully into my hair. I'd curled up against him, almost like when he'd caught me at the pods that first night. But him doing that made my neck stretch back, and he started a low, vibrating purr. My more chittering. Feel the changes inside of you. You, a hiss and a thick. For me, soft throat droma, soft enough to take my seed and let it grow, he said, and started pumping me in earnest. I could feel his tendrils inside, almost like they were pulling him in deeper each time. Your egg is mine, he said, and then made a possessive snarl. Give your egg to me. I whined, suspended by his claspers. Brush feet swung up to pet my belly, like they could help my ovaries release. And then they dove lower, to pull me more open. And we were making slapping wet sounds where he was pulsing in and out. And sensations perfused me. I didn't know if it was the rhythmic swinging in his arms, the way he thrust his organ, or the now familiar scent of his voluminous lubrication but when he told me he felt me changing, I believed. I may not have been a Skarsarak, but I was shedding the skin of what I once was, just like my mother had before me, and grasping an opportunity. Strugox, my only, I panted as he thudded into me. Fill me. He made a wild sound at that, and his clawed hand released my hair and pressed against my back, smashing me against him as his claspers held me tight. You are ready, he said, and rattled his organ, and I came, screaming into his chest plate. Thuck, thuck, thuck. He clicked at me, and then he was coming too. I knew it. I could feel his tendrils jerking as his shells clattered over one another above me. Then he lowered us to the bed as one, holding me carefully while keeping himself inside me. You will have my hatchling, Droma, he said, running his soft brush feet over me again and again. And everyone will know it. I had thought that was a metaphor, but it wasn't. He meant to keep his organ in me, plugging my birth hole tight. For how long? I'd asked him in disbelief when I realized what was going on. Until it takes, he said, seeming relaxed even though part of himself was still inside me. My chittering sounds will tell me. The tendrils, I asked, making a feathering gesture with my hand. Yes, he said, rocking himself back over me. And until then, I will mate you as many times as it takes. Strugox, I complained as he moved in me again. I planted a fist against his side, but I found I didn't mean it. As his organ began to rattle, Brushfeet jumped in to stroke my clit as I felt his tendrils tug. Strugox, I shouted as I came incredibly quickly. How? I pleaded because I wanted to know. Mates, Droma is only. He groaned as he came again, and not even his organ could hold it in me. I felt a fresh splash of seed spill out against my lower thigh. See? he asked, running a claw hand through my hair. It wasn't even worth trying to fight him. Only, I agreed. Strugox mated me again and again over the course of the next few hours. It seemed the second he had made seed, he wanted to shoot it in me. He would rock over me, shake, and piston and brush, his claspers holding me tight. My only job was to come, and soon I was in a sex-filled haze, until another Skarsarak came in. I screamed in fear and clung to Strugox's chest, still pinned by him, while the king himself was unconcerned. Strugox spoke to the newcomer and then reached down to lift up my thigh. 
exposing everything where we both met so the other Skarsrak could look. What? Why? I squealed, squirming, as the two of them began to speak above me. Strugox's brush feet stroked down my back. Because he needs to see, he said, pausing from speaking his own tongue to explain to me. He said a few more words, then the other Skarsrak knelt and left. To show you are only my mate and no others, he added, rolling back on top of me. The movement released more of what I now thought of as an intoxicating scent from him, and my thighs fell wide again. Droma's body knows, he said, grunting the words as he thrust into me with a rumble. Strugox. It was my turn to croon. I held onto the arms of his first set of claspers, my own hips thudding back mindlessly. My body did know. It had known all along, and it wanted him. I had no idea what it meant to be mated, much less to a Skarsarak. But maybe it was this. Droma's egg, Strugox said, as his organ began to pulse and rattle, his tendrils searching in me all over again. Bathing in my seed. Yes, yes, I hissed, and then howled, coming for him. After that, all sorts of Skarsrak felt like they could visit. At first, I was scared by their presence in the room, but all of them seemed... pleased? They would inspect the place where Strugox joined me and make low, humming, clicking sounds. One of them that was missing a fang brought us food to eat, which Strugox fed me. Another one, with deep scars across his breastplate, changed our sheets often and cleaned our waste away. Over time, I realized that what was happening now was like a ceremony. Maybe Skarsrak didn't sign contracts or say vows. Maybe for them, it was seeing one another in this act, the scent of sex heavier than any sacred incense. Strugox taught me words while I was bound to him, matters of feelings and anatomy. And while I was awful at it, that didn't stop me from trying, and he was a patient teacher. As he did so, I tried to intuit more about him and his life, reading around the corners of what he was willing to tell me. Some questions he would answer completely, telling me stories about his home planet and his childhood, before asking the same of me. Other questions he practically ignored, no matter how frustrated I got with him, how he knew my language and his recent past or they would always lead to mating to distract me. Which didn't matter, because no matter how often we mated, and it seemed like that was all we did, I was always, always ready. There was something about being around him, even when he'd already taken me more times than I could count, that made me insatiably voracious. It was like I was possessed by something else entirely, to become a creature of need and wanton lust. One of his conversations with one fang after he'd brought us food and water, was taking longer than I could stand. Strugox, I whispered, writhing. I immediately had my mate's attention. He rolled himself above me and pulled me to his chest, beginning to move his organ in the pattern that I liked. Droma, he hissed, and it was like the other Skarsrak wasn't there, as Strugox's claspers held my hips for him to use me. Yes, I gasped, screwing my eyes shut trying to pretend we were alone. I had been raised in court. I knew true ladies didn't do any of this. But any concerns I might have had at being mounted in front of others disappeared with Strugox's total lack of compunction. His brush feet came for me, my nipples and clit, as he started to thrust meaningfully. I wrapped my arms around his hard-shelled neck, traced one of my fingers in the groove beneath his jaw that I knew he liked and held on until I couldn't help myself, and neither could he, both of us coming almost at the same time. I screamed as he thrummed and hissed, him coming hard enough to clatter, and more of his dark fluids poured from where we met, spattering on the bed, ruining our sheets again. I'm sorry, I panted, apologizing. Never, Droma, he said, as he laid us both back down together. It is good that you need me. Why? I asked in the drowsy exhaustion that now permeated my being. It makes a stronger hatchling. He swept one of his brush feet over me, held me to his chest, then finished his prior conversation. For five days, Strugox and I did nothing but mate, and every Skarsrak on the entire ship must have known it. 
between them seeing where we met, watching us in person, and no doubt hearing my frantic cries. I lost whatever shame I might have had about the situation, and every lick of fear, cradled safely as I was in Strugox's many, many arms. And then I woke to Strugox stroking me. Droma, my only. He said, encouraging me to open my eyes. I was so very tired. I'd hardly slept the entire time we were together, but I still wanted what he had to give me. I opened my legs wider and I curled against his chest. Droma, I mate, he went on, his voice low. We must separate. I twisted my head against him. No. I felt him chitter, which I knew now was definitely a laugh. Yes he said, before carefully picking me up and pulling himself out of me. I whined as a violent flood of his fluids gushed from me, now that I was free. No, I complained again as he gently put me down. Thuk, 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 he said. My hatchling is inside you. Our mating was successful. I pressed a hand to my belly, the space between my legs feeling suddenly bereft, some small part of my common sense returning. He retracted all of his claspers for the first time in days, and I saw all of the red marks that they had left on me in angry stripes. I wished that I could keep them there. I felt that I had earned them. Will I really be an empress? I asked him, looking up. I promise you, my drama. He rotated one of his hand claws to rub the curved back of it against my belly. Even if I have to conquer an entire galaxy. After that, I was free to come and go as I pleased. And now that I felt safer looking at the other Skarzarak, I could easily tell each of them apart. One fang and claw chest had the same strange divots on their shoulder shells as Strugox did, but he wouldn't tell me how they had come by them when I asked. But he did tell me we were flying as fast as the Jofan could handle toward a rendezvous with another Skarzarak ship. The Jofan still hadn't gained the capacity to jump, and I gathered their own ship had been damaged when it hit the Jofan to, ironically, keep it from jumping itself. I was the only human left alive on board, and with the exception of losing Matrar, I was surprisingly all right with that. None of the Skarzarak here wanted to kill me, anymore, which was something I couldn't say for sure amongst a human crowd normally. And every night and morning and sometimes in the middle of the day, Strugox would mate me, and I loved it. No, it was more than that. I craved it from him. It was like until he was in me again, I was holding my breath, and it wasn't till we were joined that I could breathe. I told him that, and I watched him shudder, making all of his shells clatter against one another, which I knew he did when he felt deeply. It was not the kind of thing I would ever have told another human, because humans could betray you. Showing a soft underbelly, or a soft throat, to other people at court was as good as admitting that you wanted to die. But there was no court here, and at night it was just he and I, and the words flowed out of my mouth in a moment of honesty before I could stop them. Droma, my only, he said, moving at once to thrust himself in me again, no matter that he'd just came. You may always breathe around me, he said, and he fell asleep inside me. The next morning, I woke to him rutting me again. I laughed and shifted. I need to go to the bathroom, and I want to eat. I've been ravenous ever since our successful mating. I'd probably worked halfway through the Jofan stores personally. Strugox made a dismissive sound. It is important. Why? I asked, amused. He paused and pet my belly with a set of brush feet. I want to keep him warm and get my scent on him. I laughed at that. I don't think that's how any of that works. But I knew I was pregnant, and my body was changing. My breasts were getting bigger and more sensitive to his touch. You think he'll be a boy? Yes, he said definitively, then gave a thoughtful chitter. But I would cherish a girl to my heart. There was something sad about the way he said it, and I pushed myself away from him. Where are the women, Strugox? While all of the Skarzarak had different markings on them from their lives, they all looked the same, and I thought I knew enough about his species now to know that they were male. Yet if he had a sex organ that fit me, surely there were some other of his own kind that it also ought to fit in. 
That is a long story. Which was something I'd learned, he said, when he didn't want to talk. I made the sound of frustration I had learned from him back, like rubbing rocks together in my throat, before saying, So? I want to hear it. He hissed, blowing me off, before running his claw hand through my hair in a way that he knew soothed me. Later, drama. Mating now. We finished. I got clean and ate, and was going back to our quarters to lie down and rest when the ship's alarms went off. I ran to the control center, in time to see three of the Imperium's finest distance-jumping ships begin to fill the screen, as each of them flipped out of subspace. My father's men, come for me at last, and I knew what they would do to him. I made to run in front of Strugox, like I could protect him with my body, but Claw Chest caught me across the stomach and pulled me back, tossing me on my ass behind the nearest door. After seeing what he'd done, his jaws sprang open in horrified surprise, and the pinpricks of his golden pupils lit upon my belly. Tell me I have not hurt you. You haven't, I said, struggling up against the wall. What's going on? And then I stood on my own two feet and gasped. You also understand me, Clawchest chittered before answering. Yes. I, I wanted to yell at him, and at Strugox, for not telling me everything already. I stepped close enough to trigger the door again but then paused at hearing my father's voice overhead, clearly saying Strugox's name. Clawchest wrapped his arms around me so I could go no further, but from here I could keep listening. And the crew of the Jofon? My father was asking. Ask of whom you want, old man, Strugox challenged him. I heard my father's familiar, irritated sputter. The girl on board, where is she? Strugox answered back in the Skarzarak tongue, and despite having always been told we couldn't understand them because they were so brutish, I heard a feminine voice translate him in pleasant tones. We fucked her and then we spaced her. There was a pause, where Strugox waited for the translation to be through, before adding more into the queue. As you have always told us, we are merely animals. What did you expect? She was of my blood! my father shouted. And I made sure to get her virgin blood on me, Strugox told him. I stiffened in claw chest's arms at hearing it. You broke the treaty first, old man, he went on, the translation in no way encapsulating the depth of his hatred as he snarled. You poisoned our homeworld and killed all our women, so I will fuck all of your daughters before I am through. Behind the Imperium jumpers, a massive Skarsarak warship flipped out of subspace, and the shooting began. I shook myself out of Claw Chest's grasp and ran as the Jofan shook. I didn't know where I was going, as there was nowhere to go. I thought I'd been playing to win a game, but instead I'd lost my foolish heart. My feet took me back to the captain's quarters out of habit, where I found Strugox, putting his decorated shell chest on. I stood staring at him, breathing hard. I heard everything, I told him, once it was settled about his shoulders. He took a step toward me. Then you heard the truth about your father, and many lies from me. Did you know I was here when you attacked the Jofan? I asked, as I retreated. Strugox chittered. Yes. And you were with me just to best him? I put a hand to my belly and let my fingers all curve in. No and then Strugox cleared the distance between us in an instant, picking me up in all his claspers, so I had no choice but to look into his eyes. The second you took my fangs in your grasp, I knew I had to have you, Droma. And when you asked for me to be your only, I was sure that it was fate. Which is why you said those things, I said, twisting, ignoring the way the ship's lights were blinking and the danger we were in. I need for him to follow me, Droma so that I can keep you safe. He slowly set me down, lowering himself to kneel in front of me, taking my soft hands in his claw hands and putting them against the shell parts of his face, asking for me to tuck them beneath his chin and stroke the soft line there. Only you, Droma, he said, tracing the backs of his claws against my tear-stained cheeks and belly. Only you and our hatchling. Only you. Always. Then he reached for the braid of hair I'd laced atop his shell, 
I watched him tug it free and put it in his mouth. No, I whispered quietly, finally fully understanding. No, I shouted as he stood and turned to begin walking down the hall. Clawchest appeared, picking me up, this time much more carefully, grunting, rescue ship. No, I shouted at the back of my receding mate. Only Strugox! I howled after him, knowing he heard me, fighting with all my might to get Clawchest to put me down. Only Strugox! Only Strugox! I called out until my throat was torn. Clawchest got me onto another ship, and then a second. I felt the familiar spring-like tension before I jump. Then we were clear. He carried me out, still struggling, and then set me on my feet in the middle of a launch bay. Almost all of the Skarsrak I had seen on the Jofan were here, except for one. I turned to Clawchest. Strugox? I asked him, making my mate's name a question. He shook his head and chittered, and I launched myself at him, hitting his dented chest plates again and again, while all of the Skarsrak present gathered round to watch. He took my blows. There was no way I could have hurt him, and we both knew it, until my anger burned away to sadness and I had no more tears to cry. Then one of the Skarsrak said something, and Clawchest translated it for me. Your hatchling makes you fierce. No, I said back in their tongue, one of the few words that was easy for a human throat to manage. I was always fierce, I said, turning back to look, as Clawchest told them. That's why Strugox mated me. And I realized as I said it, that all the words were true. I had been Strugox's mate, and they all knew it. It was his hatchling I was growing, and there were promises he'd made me. Things that I was owed. You heard my father claim me, I said, and claw chest echoed what I said in Skarsarak behind me. As I stepped forward to be among them, I shouted so they could hear the tone of my voice, even if they didn't know my words. And you all saw Strugox mate me. I said, shouting even louder. So each of you know that the next emperor of the loyal empire is in my womb. Clawchest's translation rang out a moment later, and the nearest warrior clattered. Then a second, then a third, until the entire landing bay was clamorous with the sounds of them beating their shells against one another with intensity. When they were finished, I lifted the bottom of my shirt and shoved down the top of my pants so they could see where he was growing. And if you think I am fierce, I said, my torn throat making me sound almost as they did, with claw chest calling my words after me in their tongue. And if you think I am fierce, I proclaimed, to the sounds of more clattering all around me as I planted a possessive hand on my belly, where Strugox's brush feet had liked to stroke. My hatchling says wait and see. I heard a close clattering behind me, as Clawchest finally succumbed, falling to his knees, and other Skarsrak knelt in a spiraling wave, shouting exclamations as I surveyed them. The weather was changing again, but my whole life had made me ready for it. I was my father's daughter. I was my mother's child, and I had been Strugox's only, born with the blood to rule, the cunning to manage it, and the strength of having known true love. And to secure a future for my hatchling, nothing was beyond me. Thank you for listening. For more of Cassie Alexander's stories and audiobooks, be sure to check out her website at www.cassiealexander.com.